This handsome little devil is a swart space tone reverb, and the owner says that he was trying to change tubes, and he did it while the amp was on, and now it doesn't work. So let's take a look and see what the owner has done, and uh, if there's any damage caused by that, and how the amp is built, and how it's constructed, and how it sounds. Now I know there's a perception out there that I just like to, quote, crap on amps, end quote. No, I have every hope that this thing is just a joy and a delight for decades and decades to come, and it's just a source of great inspiration and music. But if it has any downsides, any weaknesses, I think it's only fair that I might point them out. Let's see what we get. I really do like the looks of this amp. It's, it's quite beautiful in its way with the dark lacquered tweed and the kind of dark bronze or dark brass piping. Very nice. Let's look at the inside and see what the owner might have done to this beauty. Here's where I feel a little bit of trepidation because I see that these four screws on this panel are going into the wood of the cabinet, but there are no screws connecting the chassis to this rear panel, but neither are there screws connecting the chassis to the wood cabinet elsewhere, so I'm not quite sure what's holding everything in place. I'm going to have to tilt this over and get in there with a mirror and see what's up before I just blindly take this rear panel off. I don't want to do that and have everything fall out or whatever, so just one moment. Okay, the way to do it is to tilt on its side like this so that the weight is supported down and the chassis is sandwiched between uh, the rear panel and the sides, the side cleats of the cabinet. And there are metal inserts behind here which take machine screws. All that is fantastic. I'm seeing what look to be very good quality ceramic sockets. Uh, the board is very straightforward, kind of like you might find in an old Gibson, only without all the nasty glue that Gibson used. A lot of very neat work in there. We'll get to the insides. It's got JJ's all around, that's fine. And it's got a lovely Celestion G12 Blue Alnico with a good quality speaker cable, with a good quality Switchcraft plug. It's got quick connects rather than soldering, but many people prefer that. It's got an IEC cable, a good heavy duty one, and it is bolted to the side of the cabinet, and it's got lovely connectors on its reverb tank, the same ones that I just installed on that Princeton yesterday. So at this point, this should pull out. It does. So let me get this on the bench and put the cabinet to the side. We'll take a look at the amp more properly. All right, here it's got what looks to be a Haybor. This is definitely Haybor on the output transformer. It looks to be a Haybor on the power. It's a very good sized power transformer for a single ended amp. So, kind of impressed. Looks like something you might find from a Princeton. It's got a JJ multi section can cap. I'm not a huge fan of those, but if uh, they've had a high success rate, more power to them. Let's take a look at the insides. All right, before we go to the insides of the amp as an overview, let's look at what I suspect might have happened to cause a problem. And um, so we're going to not have a great narrative structure because we're going to skip to the reveal. But on these octal sockets, the locator key pin is here on each one. And if either, either of these tubes were put in incorrectly, the rectifier or the output, then we could have problems. So when I pull this tube out, the locator pin needs to be here in line with this screw. It was, so that's good. And the rectifier the same way. It was, okay, so the owner did not make the same mistake that the owner of the Black Star made. So it's very possible that there was just some arcing when you change either, I don't know which one you change, probably the output tube. You can put a 6V6 or a 6L6 in this. It might have been some arcing at the moment of change, which just blew a fuse. So let me find my little, where's my little blue handled screwdriver? Which one of you guys took it? Here it is. I'm gonna flip this around and look at these fuses. So this is the mains fuse in the fuse drawer. And it is blown, which is good in this case. That explains a lot has a spare in here. That's 
I guess it'd be better if I showed you. There's a spare in the holder, that's good. Let's leave that spare in, in, the, in the spare location. And this is a one amp slow blow. We're gonna put another one right in here. Let me get one of those out. Okay. So one thing soft. Let's check the HT fuse, which is not blown. And it is a 3AG 500 milliamp. Let me uh, take a quick sniff test and real close inspection inside. If I see anything faulty, I'll show you. I'll give you a tour of the insides in a little bit, but first I want to check a couple of things that are often problematic on uh, amps as they come in. That's where the hardware is tight. So what I think is a standby switch is tight. Power switch was tight. Both of them were tight, just not as tight as they could be. Certainly much tighter than most. I'm going to give them a, a little bit more. I just like to have those things really, really tight because if they come loose while you're playing, you can have shorts happen. So those are not as tight as they could be, but neither was what I would call loose or dangerous. No wiggle there. Let me point out something crucial. Unlike a lot of other <clears throat> boutique makers, they have lock washers on the pots. Those tooth washers really help. I bet these are tight. I will verify on one of them in just a moment. Let's verify the input jacks are tight. Could barely turn it. So fairly, fairly tight on that. Let's, let's check the volume pot just to be sure. Now let's see, that lines up right there. I just like to know because, you know, the owner's paying for my time. And, and even if the only thing he ends up needing is just uh, a new fuse and a lesson learned about not doing that, such things again, that's good and tight. Then while I have the amp and I'm billing him, I might as well make sure there aren't any other problems and the amp is as good as possible. So, so far, everything I'm seeing is quite excellent. Perfect? No. But really, really good so far. And it might have been perfect when it left the factory then traveled 5,000 miles vibrating in a truck, in which case it's held up really well. So, you know, nothing I'm doing is slamming the, the maker. But I also want to check the speaker jacks. And the, the foot speaker jack, the foot switch jack, and the uh, reverb connections almost as tight as I could make it. Again, almost. Yeah, all those passed my sniff test. I, I don't, well, that's a figurative sniff test. I also do a literal sniff test where I get my nose up close to everything to see if anything's burned. This amp so far seems really good. So a lot of hand wired stuff done well. Um, if I were to nitpick, I'd think there's some excess wiring. The lead dress could be a little bit better, but the gain in an amp like this is low enough that they'll probably more than get away from it. It'd be very easy to do service on this amp in the future. Uh, everything's done to these turrets very well. It's, uh, they've got good separation on the output cathode between the resistor and the cap. Should not bake. Good quality components used intelligently. Everything here looks really well, really well done. I don't expect it's going to have any problems. I think the likeliest thing is that he took out the uh, 6L6 and tried to put in the 6V6 and it just arced. And we don't hot swap power tubes. It's possible this tube was damaged in the process. Probably okay. Let's find out. That's why fuses exist. So let me uh, get my speaker cable an adapter so I can plug this into its speaker without putting it all the way back together yet. Forgive the somewhat unorthodox angle here. I wanted to see these tubes and anything here in case there are any sparks or any problems when we power it up. This way you get to see it too. And before I power it on, I want to do something that some of you might think I'm just deliberately trying to find faults. But honestly, this is something that I have done on many, 
many amps and found faults with, which is just making sure that the hardware is tight to begin with. And uh, let me turn off the power there for a second so I can get that one safely. Just make sure that all the transformers are tight and all of these are cranked down really solid. I can't turn it at all. So I wasn't trying to make this fail. If anything, I just showed why this is a really good app. So, you know, sometimes it reveals really good things about certain apps, which just heighten the ones that do get criticized. But let's power it on in standby. The light came on. I'm watching my current limiter. I'm looking to see if there's any sparks any issues, any flashes in the tubes. All right, now before I take it out of standby, let's make sure that rectifier is working. 302 volts, so yeah. Let's take it out of standby. I'm not hearing anything, but then again, the volume's off. That Oh, that's good. That's a real quiet noise floor. Real low noise floor. Flip the switch. All right, the higher gain still has a fairly low noise floor. That noise at the moment of switching is unfortunate. They are switching a wire going to, to a grid over here on one of the preamp tubes, which means that at the moment of switching, that grid, grid has no ground reference. I might reach out to Mr. Swart and suggest the addition of a 3 to 10 meg resistor to ground from that point, which, which would uh, eliminate that popping. Everything else in this amp so far has been done so well that I am full of nothing but goodwill towards him. Let me plug a guitar in briefly. My wife is upstairs doing a Zoom call, so I cannot really play this right now, but I can make sure that it's passing signal and sounds all right. All right, that CTS uh, audio taper volume pot's doing what CTS audio taper volume pots do. Let me show you, let me move the mic, uh, camera rather. Ignore the clutter on the bench. So zero, I'm gonna strum a chord. It's a nine o'clock before you hear anything, it just cuts on. That's a problem with CTS, not the sort. And the low gain. So, it's passing signal just fine. As far as the repair goes, just a blown fuse. The owner got lucky, and I don't think the owner will hot swat tubes again. And uh, I'm about to put this back in its chassis and reconnect the reverb and uh, do some high volume testing, make sure that no damage happened to that 6v6, though I don't think any did. And then you guys will get to hear it for real. There are a lot of YouTube playing demos of this model on the, the internet already. I'm not gonna worry about doing an extensive one. I just wanted to do a proof that the amp is working and sounding good. Um, I think it sounds great. <laughs> The amp has almost no hum or noise floor. And unless you build amps, you don't know uh, what a hat trick that is uh, with a single ended amp like this. So kudos to Michael Swart for getting a very quiet single ended amp. Uh, really sounds good it, with the e very efficient uh, blue that's in here. <laughs> It punches well above its weight. You know, I guess it's nominally a five watt amp. You'd be surprised how loud five watts can be. It's pushing up to really hang with a 12 watt Princeton. The wattage difference is there. The, the dB difference is not really there. You have to get to 
really a deluxe reverb to start noticing a little bit more and really get to like a AC30, JTM45 or Marshall 50 watt before we like, yeah, that's definitely louder. This is, this is quite loud for a lot of stages. It would be very sufficient. That's quite versatile. Um, it takes gain, does gain well, does clean great. It's a very nice amp that also has to, happens to be very attractive. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm kind of impressed by this. I did. I must confess, I did depop the switch for high low gain. because that popping was bugging me. I hope that didn't void the warranty. I don't think it will. I think only Michael Swart and I would know what I did or be able to spot it. As for the owner of this Swart, he learned a very valuable lesson. Don't hot swap tubes when an amp is powered on. Uh, could have been a very expensive mistake as it was I'm gonna be nice and just charge them in a half hour. I'm not gonna charge them a full hour, let alone the full bench fee, which covers two hours. I'm not even gonna charge them for the fuse. So, you know, I did have to not just change the fuse, but make sure that was the only thing wrong with it. You know, it's not like you charge them half an hour to change a fuse, but uh, you know, the, the rest of the time I spent on this was really to, to get a review for you guys. And I think that's, that's uh, a good investment of my time but that's all the time I can give to just review right now. I've got a lot of other amps uh, in the cooker. But uh, as to my review of this Swart Space Tone Reverb, I've got a 64 Princeton in the other room. I just finished a 64 Princeton Reverb, a 75 Princeton Reverb, a uh, 58 Vibrolux, and a 57, 58, um, I don't recall now, Tweed Princeton. And uh, I would put this next to any of them. This would be a, a really good choice next to any of them. It may not have the vintage mojo, but it, it has the sound and it has the build quality. And um, at the price, you know, 1600 new-ish, that's really, really good for what you get here. So this is, uh, I think, the first A-plus review I've given, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to give it. I'd like to give more. Thanks for watching.